Great. Great. Excellent. Great. Excellent. Mike. Good. Okay, great. All right. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and to be able to sign the budget for fiscal year 25. I want to recognize and thank our Senate President, Karen Spilka, and our Speaker, Ron Mariano, for their leadership and partnership in this process. And I want to especially thank, on behalf of Lieutenant Governor, uh, Driscoll and myself, Chair Michaelwitz and Chair Rodericks uh, for their work with our team as well as members of, of the conference committee. We're delighted to be here today. I see other uh, friends in the legislature in attendance, including Rep Scanlon, Senator O'Connor, Rep Vitolo, uh, among others. And I know that many are still in the midst of a lot of work right now. So really, really grateful to the House and to the Senate uh, for this budget and uh, really delighted to be able to sign this budget today. I also want to thank members of our administration, beginning with our Secretary of Administration and Finance, <coughs> Matthew Gorkowitz, uh, his team, including Budget Director Chris Marino, our General Counsel, Martha Kwasnick, and the entire team at ANF, including our Under Secretary Jennifer Sullivan. I want to thank our Lieutenant Governor and all the members of our Cabinet, I think all of whom are here today, and their teams for the recommendations and support they provided throughout this process. And we all, I think, want to thank the residents who advocated, who testified, who made calls, wrote letters, met with all of our teams to make their voices heard. Massachusetts today, we are firing on all cylinders. This year, we've been ranked number one for innovation, number one for education. We've been ranked the best place in the country to raise a family and the best business environment, according to US News and World Report. I think that's pretty great. But at the same time, we know that the competition is fierce and our residents face challenges. So we are not resting and we're not taking our foot off the gas. We're going on offense with this budget and so much more. We're delivering on collective priorities and driving our state forward with urgency and purpose. Now, the budget today represents a whole lot of things. Uh, one thing it represents is investments on things that we're already leaning on, uh, leading on and making them even better. This includes our number one ranked schools and our nation leading childcare policy. We're also tackling our biggest challenges by lowering household costs and improving transportation. We're doing this all responsibly, fiscally responsibly, staying within our means and in line with the rate of inflation. We're worked hard, we've worked hard to make sure that every taxpayer dollar is focused on making life better for all who live and work in our state. 
This budget funds Literacy Launch, which is our plan to provide high quality evidence-based reading instruction to every student from age three to grade three. Schools using the right materials are seeing major gains, and we can now bring that advantage to more Massachusetts students. That is in addition to important funding for education, like fully funding the Student Opportunity Act to invest more in our schools than ever before. Continuing to fund free breakfast and lunch for every public school child in Massachusetts, which saves families money and feeds hundreds of thousands of children. We're also fully phasing in the tax cuts that we passed last year. For families, that now means the most generous universal child and dependent tax credit in the entire country. This budget also makes permanent the C3 child care provider grants that have stabilized the critical child care sector here in Massachusetts and protected more than 20,000 child care seats statewide. The C3, remember, this was a pandemic error program supported through the federal government. And when that funding went away, this group collectively made a decision that it was going to continue to fund child care for families in this state. We appreciate that. This is a decision to keep funding with $450, $475 million of state dollars that we are now putting that investment on, permanent, uh, on a permanent course. That means not only that providers will survive, but we'll have more opportunity to make sure that kids in our state have child care that's affordable. We know that child care is a nationwide challenge, and once again, Massachusetts is leading. This budget also funds a historic expansion of college access across our state. Now, last year, we launched and funded Mass Reconnect. Mass Reconnect, the program that makes community college free for students 25 and older, which has already brought back thousands of people to school. It's been a game changer for them, for our workforce. This year's budget builds on that by making community college cost-free for all residents of our state through Mass Educate. Massachusetts will now have the most comprehensive free community college program in the United States. And I want to recognize the Senate President and members of the legislature for prioritizing that commitment because it's a commitment that is going to save money and unlock opportunity for students all across our state. And as we expand career training partnerships at community colleges, it will help us build the workforce that we need to keep our economy driving forward. The budget also levels up our work to make transportation more reliable and more affordable in our state. We're adding $45 million in supplemental Chapter 90 funding for local roads and bridges. We're doubling our operating support for the MBTA and funding the T's Reduced Fare Program for Low Income Riders. We're also investing in fare-free bus service at our 15 statewide regional transit authorities. I want to thank the Speaker and members of the House for prioritizing that investment in our regional equity efforts. We're also taking a new step forward in transportation financing because for the first time, we're using $250 million of fair share funding to leverage $1 billion of investment in our roads, bridges, and rails. That's going to build on, and really not just build on, but accelerate our success, winning federal funds, and upgrading our transportation infrastructure across Massachusetts. For the second year in a row, we're devoting a full 1% of the state budget to energy and environment. This funding will advance our climate goals and our leadership on clean energy and community resilience. This budget also establishes a permanent disaster relief fund to support our communities when they're struck by severe flooding and storms or similar harms. We saw after last year's floods how helpful this tool would have been, and now we've got that in place. We'll continue to invest in communities and we'll continue to be ready with help when problems occur. All of these investments are focused on making life better, making life easier for people in Massachusetts, making it more affordable to live here, to work here, to raise children here. This also makes us more competitive 
more competitive for our employers, for economic growth, particularly as we compare ourselves to other states. So it's a really important investment, this budget. There are more big things coming down the pike. Uh, the legislature is working very hard to complete historic bills, busy, of course, on housing costs, economic development, and so much more. We're going to continue the incredible progress that we're making, and we're going to do it the way we know how, by coming together and delivering results. And I appreciate, in a country that seems so divided at times, the shared sense of partnership and purpose here. Uh, it's one of the things that makes Massachusetts special. I'm proud and privileged to be governor of the state. I'm grateful and proud to work alongside my colleagues here, uh, particularly in the House and the Senate. I thank them for the budget that I was able to sign today and for the continued collaboration and commitment and care in the well-being of residents across our state. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our Secretary of Administration and Finance. And again, thank you, Secretary Gorkowitz, uh, to you and your team for all the work over the last several weeks. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. It's great to be here today to sign the fiscal year 2025 budget. It's the end uh, of result of months of hard work and reflects the ongoing partnership between this administration and the legislature. I want to start by thanking Governor Healy, Lieutenant Governor Driscoll, for pushing us to be bold, be creative, and deliver for the people of Massachusetts. To my fellow members of the Cabinet and the Governor's Office, we wouldn't be here today if it weren't for your thoughtful collaboration, so thank you all. And to my a &F team, thank you for your tireless work, dedication, and professionalism throughout this process. I know it has meant working long hours and nights, um, and I'm grateful for you and all you've contributed in getting, this, getting us to this point, so thank you. And also a big thank you to Chairman Rodericks and Michaelowitz for your continued partnership and willingness to listen and engage. It is that relationship that has allowed us to deliver a balanced, fiscally responsible budget that reflects our shared priorities and will make a difference for the people of Massachusetts. So again, thank you. And this is a budget we can all be proud of. With a bottom line of $57.8 billion, the 3.1% growth in spending in FY25, which includes the surtax spending, falls in line with current rates of inflation, a goal we set out to reach when we filed back in January. We are also doubling down in areas where, Massachusetts ex where we excel in Massachusetts, from quality of life to education and talent. And by working collaboratively, we are able to deliver on these investments with a strong focus on regional equity and meeting the needs of local communities. I'm proud that we are continuing our strong support for the 351 cities and towns across the Commonwealth. That is why this budget provides a 3% increase over FY24 in unrestricted government aid to municipalities for a total of, of over $1.3 billion. It is the second year in a row this administration, in partnership with our legislature, has been able to increase unrestricted government aid by 3%. The governor mentioned fully funding the Student Opportunity Act, which continues to provide a historic boost in funding for local districts. What it means in this budget is nearly $7 billion of Chapter 78, a 4% increase over 24. We're investing more than ever before in our local schools. We are also leveraging fair share dollars in a way that is transformative and how we think voters intended us to use this money when they approved it in the ballot box. That includes things like Free Community College, championed by Senate President Spilka, and building on the success of the Governor's Mass Reconnect program, which began this past year and drove enrollment across all of our community colleges. It includes investment in regional transit authorities, money added by the House through their efforts, and covers free fares at RTAs outside of Greater Boston. And it includes maximizing $250 million in surtax revenue by pledging it to this Commonwealth Transportation Fund, where we can leverage that to more than $1 billion over the next 10 years in important transportation infrastructure, a proposal that both branches supported. We are funding important initiatives with fair share dollars that otherwise would not be possible with the constraints within our operating budget. And we are doing so in a way that sets up education and transportation sectors for long-term success. This budget is balanced, responsible, and forward-looking. And while, as it should come as no surprise, we have some uncertainty as it relates to our existing tax revenue collections, something we'll have to monitor closely over the coming months, the budget being signed here today gives us the tools we need to effectively manage spending and deliver the programs and services expected of us. Thank you, and I would like to turn it over to uh, Senate President Karen Spilker. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I first want to thank the governor for this pin, for signing the budget, and add that I look forward to getting more of these before the next session starts. So yes, we all can agree on that. So that's very exciting. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to thank uh, Senate Ways and Means Chair Rodericks and his incredible team uh, and uh, Chair Mikowitz uh, for House Ways and Means. Being a prior chair of Ways and Means, I know how much time is put into drafting and uh, resolving a budget. I know how much time their staffs, their re respective staffs, have put in to resolve this budget. So thank you very much, and thank you to the Secretary of ANF, who is a true partner in working all things budget. So thank you. I'd like to thank Governor Healy and Lieutenant Governor Driscoll for their leadership and your continued partnership. We can't get things done the way we do here, here in Massachusetts without their leadership and partnership. It means a lot. I'd like to also thank my friend and colleague, Speaker Mariano, who works hard every single day on behalf of the residents of the Commonwealth. And I'd like to thank everybody, all the secretaries, legislators that are here, advocates. Thanks for an amazing budget. It truly is an amazing budget. When we began this session in January 2023, I had said, that we needed, the state needed a student opportunity plan to support our residents, more than just a K-12 Student Opportunity Act, as important at that, as that was and is, as all of you know. We need something to help our residents from cradle to career, from the moment they are eligible for preschool to the day that they graduate from college, and expand the opportunities that come with public education to any resident who wants them because every resident deserves them. And our Commonwealth is simply stronger when all of our residents have the tools to fully participate and contribute to our economy. Today, with the governor's signature, I am really excited that we are realizing that plan through codifying C3 grants to make early education accessible and making community college free for all residents. Changing, and I've heard this from some of the folks who have gone to or who want to go to community college, changing them saying, I wish to I will. That is very powerful. Uh, the also investments in fare free regional transit, regional equity has been an important uh, area for the Senate and investing in support systems and resources for every single part of the state. This budget is a strong budget that reflects our collective values and our collective priorities right here in Massachusetts. It will truly position our Commonwealth to be more affordable, more equitable, and more competitive in every sense of the word. Thank you again for all that has made this a reality, and I'd like to now turn it over, turn the microphone over to Speaker Mariano. Thank you, Thank you Senate President. Um, Again, this is a momentous occasion, and I'd like to begin by congratulating the governor and the lieutenant governor, and mentioning especially the secretary, for the creative use of the funding and the alternatives that you've provided in this budget to help us keep our commitment of funding programs that we think are important. What we have here is two or three examples of creative use of the money that we're getting through this tax increase. And we are able to maintain levels of commitment that in this area, this era of inflation is extremely difficult. But through the creative financing of the Secretary and the proposals that you've included uh, in the, your presentation, we are in a position to present a strong fiscal note in front of the constituents that we represent today. 
And I'm very lucky to be serving with the Senate President, who with their creative ideas have come up with a plan to help educate us a workforce that may need some transitioning as we go forward. And as we continue to look at our transportation needs, we will continue to explore different ways to fund some of these, these plans that we find to be as important. So what we have here is a document that we can all sort of take a bow on. And I'd like to begin by first saying to Chairman Rodericks and Chairman Mikowitz, uh, there's a good reason why I never served in Ways and Means. Uh, and one of it is the work uh, that's involved. Uh, so, so I won't pretend to take credit uh, for the work that uh, Chairman Mikowitz has done or Chairman Rodericks has done. But I know, I know Aaron has met with 160 members and listened to requests, some of them quite outrageous. <laughs> but nevertheless, they, they are examples of priorities of members of the House of Representatives. And we are here today because we've been able to address the major needs of the 160 members elected to the House. So with that, I'd like to introduce the chairman, who had all these meetings, <laughs> Aaron Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And yes, the, uh, um, some of the requests, you know, one, one person's request that might be outrageous to, to one may be a treasure to another. So I think uh, we had to balance all that as we went through this. But I'm going to be brief. Uh, since uh, we've all mentioned we have a lot more work to get to uh, over these next couple days here to get more stuff done. Uh, I just want to thank all the people that are here uh, behind me, uh, the governor, lieutenant governor, the senate president, the speaker, uh, the chairman, uh, the secretary, for all the work that they put in uh, to getting us here today. Uh, there is a lot to be proud of uh, in this budget, as people mentioned. Uh, we, have, we were able to accomplish a lot, get a lot of new initiatives put on the table, get a lot of, uh, stabilize a lot of uh, uh, previous uh, initiatives that we've had, uh, in particular, uh, going forward with C3 grants and, and codifying that, and also just providing stability for our early, educator, early education providers uh, going forward, knowing that there is going to be uh, a resource, a funding resource, whether it be through iLottery or through uh, fair share money or other ways, uh, we are going to continue to fund C3 grants going forward, uh, and that is critical uh, to you know where you to think where we were you know right after COVID uh, in the early edu early education world to where we are today uh, and where we're going to go going forward I think is a huge amount of steps that we've taken and we're very proud of that uh, we're also very proud of continuing the Student Opportunity Act one that was in 2019 when we passed it was uh, thought of as a very bold initiative uh, to take on in terms of the amount of money and to continue to kind of uh, uh, change the game in terms of our Chapter 70 education system uh, we have led up to that commitment every year no matter through good budgets are bad. We have continued to make sure the Student Opportunity Act is part of our, is part of our initiatives. Funding free community college, obviously the Senate President's priority uh, over the last couple of years is something that we're very proud to be taking that step uh, and making sure uh, that we're creating new pathways for folks to be able to get, uh, you know, education, into the education system and into the workforce uh, and provide new opportunities to do that. And then lastly, you know, um, a record number of funding for the MBTA. Uh, which, uh, you know, obviously was something that the House was very prioritized on, uh, something that we know we still have to continue to work through and something that we're not uh, uh, walking away from but actually leaning in on uh, and something that we're going to be working on going forward, uh, knowing that the general manager is doing such a great job. We're very proud of the, those initiatives that we are putting together today. And to do all that while also keeping our rainy day fund at record numbers, having our bond rating uh, continue to be uh, strong, uh, being able to implement tax cuts, no small feat uh, uh, by any means. And it takes leadership and it takes uh, collaboration to make sure that happened. Uh, I want to particularly thank uh, my Ways and Means staff uh, uh, from the committee uh, for all the hard work that they did. I want to thank the Secretary of ANF and his staff for everything they did. And of course, uh, the Senate Ways and Means staff uh, for all the work that they did. And I'm, I have the uh, opportunity here to introduce my partner, someone I've worked extensively with over the last uh, six budgets, uh, and we're still talking to this day, uh, which says a lot about who he is, maybe more, maybe more about who he is than any of you when I am, but uh, certainly someone who I've enjoyed working with, uh, uh, Senator Mike Rodericks. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. You know, with the, uh, with the signing of the budget and the stroke of your pen, uh, 
madam governor we put the finishing touches on a budget that began a little over eight months ago when we convened the consensus revenue hearings in december of last year to begin working on the f y twenty five budget and over the course of those eight months i could not be more proud with working with such amazing dedicated uh... partners in this process uh, from the governor, lieutenant governor, and Secretary Gorkowitz, to the Senate president and her amazing team in the Senate president's office, Speaker Mariano uh, and, and all the team in, uh, in the speaker's office, uh, but um, uh, mostly with uh, my partner, uh, Chairman Mikowitz. Um, it is the sixth budget that we've co-written together, and, um, you know, I've always say uh, that, you know, he has a tough job because he has 160 members that he has to ensure that those priorities are incorporated in the budget. Uh, I have a tough job. I have 40 members that I have to ensure that the priorities of those 40 members are incorporated in the budget. Um, and somehow we get it done, and we get it done uh, every year, and we produce a product that is responsible, that is balanced, that does not dip into any of our reserve funds, whether it's the stabilization fund or the transitional escrow fund. As a matter of fact, uh, when fiscal year 24 is finally closed out, in a couple months, we are scheduled to deposit another $500 million or so into the stabilization fund, which will bring that balance close to $9 billion. And it's something we're all very, very proud of, uh, that we have been able to work together collaboratively uh, to produce a document and a budget that not just we in the legislature, but all residents and citizens of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts should be very, very proud of. So thank you all, uh, everyone. Uh, for being such great and amazing partners. And with that, I get to turn it back over to Thank the you. governor. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, again, thank you. And thank you to, uh, to everybody who uh, has worked very, very hard over days, weeks, months to, to get us to this point. So um, great day with the ability to, to uh, see this budget realized. Any questions? Governor, you, uh, you need to about a little more than three hundred million dollars. Can you say uh, why you chose uh, that amount and, and which particular areas you were concerned about? Yeah, I mean, look, our economy is strong. Our bond rating is excellent. We've got money in our rainy day fund, but it's also our responsibility to make sure that we're being fiscally responsible in a time where there's still some uncertainty as to economic conditions. And we would rather be in a position of budgeting accordingly now rather than facing the specter of having to make cuts later. Better to plan than to have to, to make cuts later. The vetoes, and Secretary um, Gorkowitz can take you through more of that, but we think these vetoes were, were vetoes that were well managed. Um, $317 million, it's more than last year, but again, we think we've done so in a way that is responsible and also um, doesn't do harm to, to the delivery of service um, as we assessed you know, what was happening here with, with the programmatic impact. Secretary, do you wish to say more? No, I think that's fine. Okay. Great. Great. Okay. That's. <laughs> yeah. Any outside sections? Um, I think we returned a couple with the amendment. So just a couple. Yep. So mass health. Yeah. Right? Two of them. Uh, two yeah, of them sure. are mass health related. Um, one Come on. The two policy sections, outside sections, uh, that we returned uh, with amendment are related to Mass Health. One has to do with uh, a payments, uh, some payments that are made to the Cambridge Health Alliance. Um, I think we view that one as a, a bit of a technical uh, amendment in that we added language to make sure that um, it's subject to federal reimbursement. It's very similar to what we did with the ambulance return, the re rates, ambulance rates last year when we returned that with an amendment. We're doing the same thing here. So I think we feel that there will be support for it, and we hope that um, we'll get that back, and, and we look forward to working with Cambridge Health Alliance and implementing um, those, um, those, uh, those rates. The other one has to do with um, notification at MassHealth to seniors um, about the different options 
options that are available to seniors whether it be senior care options pace and other benefits and programs that are afforded to them we're returning it again thinking it's a bit of a technical correction and that the language as it's currently drafted would have mass health sending member notices to members that may not necessarily qualify for those programs we think creating some confusion and so we want to make sure that that confusion doesn't happen and we also want to make sure that as mass health sends out notifications that you know folks treat medic notifications from mass health seriously and we don't want to have frivolous mail going to them that doesn't apply to them so this is really more of making sure that that language is targeted we think these are friendly amendments and have reached out and worked with our colleagues in the legislature to hopefully secure that No, I think the approach is the same. I mean, you have to make judgments at the time about what makes sense given the economic scenario and the conditions that you're in. And similarly, we, we evaluated where we're at right now. Again, we've got a strong economy, um, a lot going for us, and also there are some uncertainties out there. So we thought this was the right call, the, the fiscally responsible call. Can I just ask a quick off topic about that, Stuart? Uh, it's a great budget, though. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that, and I again, I, agree. I again I want to underscore it. because at the end of the day, whether you're talking about members in the House or members in the Senate, everybody who serves is representing seven million people out there around the state, and making sure that we've made the investments, historic investments, in education, in child care, in school meals, in mental health, in economic development, in transportation, in infrastructure, really, really important. And again, I just want to thank. Um, uh, the Speaker and the Senate President. I want to thank Chair Michaelwitz and Chair Rodericks. I want to thank Secretary Gorkowitz and the team who spends a lot of time thinking thoughtfully about the best way to maximize the return on every single dollar that we're able to spend and spend it responsibly into the betterment of life here uh, for folks in the Commonwealth. So again, I just want to thank everybody for the work uh, today and the opportunity to, to sign this budget. Now, Stewart. Stewart. Look, Stewart, it's Stewart's decision to close these hospitals. There's nothing that the state can do, that I can do, that I have the power to do to keep that from happening. But I've also said from the beginning that we are focused on health care, delivery of health care to patients, protecting jobs, protecting the stability of the market. We've had a lot of conversations. We continue to be working to save five hospitals, to make sure that we're doing all that we can for our communities. We are in this situation. And it's outrageous that we are in this situation all because of the greed of one individual, Ralph Dilatori, and the management team at Steward. As we sit here this afternoon, though, we know there is a path forward. And I call on Steward, and I call on the lenders to make it happen so that Massachusetts can be relieved of this burden and the public health emergency that we are experiencing right now. There's a path forward. We've served that up. We know what needs to happen. And we call on Stewart and Ralph Dilatori and the lenders to make it happen. Governor, what about the 30, what about the 30 million dollars that's been kicking in apparently to help keep the hospitals up and running? Well, as you know, the state provides money to, to hospitals um, around the state through, through Medicaid. And this is simply an advance on some Medicaid funding. Again, our focus is on shoring up the stability of the market, jobs, access to care for patients. And right now, we're presenting an opportunity to go out and save five hospitals, protect more communities, and more access to health care. I thought the money, the $30 million should have some kind of a receiver. He says Stewart is not trustworthy, and he doesn't trust that taxpayer money going to them will be spent on. Well, as governor and as a former attorney general, um, I know Stewart is not trustworthy, and that's why I've said from the beginning, I want Stewart out of Massachusetts yesterday. And let me be clear as well, that money is not going to Stewart. We have said, all of us, that not a dime goes to Stewart. Not a dime will go to Stewart. But we all believe in our health care workforce, in our providers here, and most importantly, in making sure that people and community have access to health care. So part of making that so in the interim is making sure that facilities have what they need to continue to operate. Again, these facilities are not owned by Stewart. They're actually owned by lenders in a bank. 
And what's happening here and what we call on to, to see through is, is a smooth transition to new ownership. As you know, we received, they received a number of qualified bids, so that's good. So this is just an interim measure to provide relief in terms of operating expenses, not for Stewart. Stewart, Ralph Dilatory, they're not going to get dime one, okay? And there are a lot of people coming after them for whatever they've squirreled away. That's a separate issue. We're making sure that we're doing what we need to do in this interim period. And again, I call on the lenders to make the deal. Well, I, we or never. I think we, we're going to pursue everything that we can to make sure that it's done in the way that's most responsible, um, both to the workforce and to the patients uh, affected. So we're going to continue to focus on that while we continue to, to push forward for a deal that, again, will will um, provide some stability and shore up uh, five other hospitals here Governor, under new ownership. Uh, no, there won't be any changes to the policy. And let me say, this budget that I just signed includes $326 million for emergency shelter. That is important. It is important that people who are unhoused or who come on hard times, either because of an eviction or because of job loss or because of a medical issue, that we're able to, to support them. Uh, victims of domestic violence, our veteran community, um, children. We are going to continue to do that, and that's funded through the budget. But the reason I implemented that policy is because we've got 8,000 families in shelter right now, and we don't have an unlimited checkbook or unlimited capacity. And so one of the things we've been focused on, getting people jobs, getting them out of shelter, and also implementing things so that people are able to move out of shelter with case management. That's what this five-day program is about, because we need to open up more spots in that shelter for temporary respite care, which is a five-day limit now. Um, and again, I call on the federal government to act. Well, half of the families are Massachusetts families. The fact of the matter is we've seen a number of immigrant families come into Massachusetts, and that is a result of failed immigration policies at the federal level, failed action by Congress at the federal level, um, and that needs to change. But the policy will remain in place. Governor, just on the end of the session, you mentioned housing, you also mentioned the economic bond bill. What other priorities do you have by the time Wednesday rolls around? Well, you know, Wednesday's coming soon, and I know all these folks have a lot to do, but I think we've got, and, and everybody's working, but certainly, um, uh, you know, housing, economic development, um, our, our uh, federal funds, these are all things that, that are important to, to, to me and to the lieutenant governor. And, um, you know, I know something that legislative colleagues have been, been focused on for, for a while. So um, we look forward to, to what comes our way um, soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.